So we are very happy to have today uh, Professor Hessam Davihar uh, joining us for the Inspire Lab seminar, which I'm hosting this year. Um, and um, I would like to also welcome you all to the seminar. Um, so Hessam is a professor, an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, Nara Arbor. And um, he got his uh, degrees from master's degree uh, from Sharif University and uh, PhD from UCSD. And um, he works on very fundamental problems in uh, coding theory, uh, but he also has some uh, experience, substantial experience uh, uh, on the practical side, so which is very rare actually uh, for coding theory. So we are very happy to uh, have him give a talk today. So without yeah. further ado. Yeah. Thanks, Emina, for a nice introduction. So I think you raised the bar about the fundamental thing. So this 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 talk is actually more about you know practical stuff that I've been doing recently actually on uh, and I started looking into designing codes for uh, for wireless systems, but from a machine learning uh, machine learning perspective. So I will just start with some. Um, uh, no brief overview of the uh, talk. So a very brief history on channel coding and some uh, some of the recent advancements in the in the wireless industry in 5G about uh, channel coding and uh, now basically talking about why you know what is the motivation behind looking at uh, machine learning aided channel coding. And uh, so the preliminaries that I'm going to talk about are codes that are constructed based on Plotkin. Uh, Platkin uh, constructions, and uh, uh, it includes Polar codes and Reed Muller codes, and um, uh, and then I will talk about uh, you know, machine learning aided uh, Reed Muller coding, and uh, a new class of codes that uh, we have uh, uh, we have designed using neural networks, and we call it we call them uh, KO codes. Um, so if you want to look at the, uh, basically, you know, the uh, history of channel coding, it all started with Hamming in 1950, the first, you know, we can say the first class of error correcting codes. Uh, and then from there, really two branches of uh, coding started. One, one branch is on algebraic codes, basically codes that use um, uh, algebraic structures like polynomials and uh, interpolation of polynomials um, to, uh, to construct the codes and decode uh, the codes. And the other branch is really, you know, just using combinatorial objects like graphs and terraces to construct and decode the code. So on the algebraic part, uh, we can say that the molar codes were the first uh, uh, codes uh, invented and on the other, other side, convolutional codes. And then from there, uh, you now we have like the Solomon codes, BCH codes, these are all state-of-the-art algebraic codes. And the other side, we have Turbo codes, LDPC codes, uh, and all of them have applications. So the Solomon codes are actually uh, used in the storage system, distributed storage systems. BCH codes are used in hard disk drives. Uh, Turbo codes are used in solar systems, basically 3G. And before, LPC codes are used in uh, Wi-Fi, conventional codes in satellite communication. So th these are all applications of uh, these uh, codes. And, um, but none of them were actually provable to achieve the capacity uh, until polar codes were invented in 2009, I cannot really characterize polar codes as you know either being uh, uh, algebraic or you know being code and graph, but they have ingredients from both sides, and um, so they, they have ideas. So the construction is actually very closely related to Reed-Muller codes, uh, but the decoding is uh, you know more like uh, uh, the modern codes, like uh, codes and graphs. Thing. And uh, so the uh, the uh, uh, Development of uh, what's happening in the wireless systems, uh, we can see that from well, the first time that uh, the, wireless, the systems uh, came, went from analog to digital, you know, first generation to second generation, we started having error correcting codes, and uh, the uh, convolutional codes uh, uh, were introduced uh, to system, uh, to wireless systems then, and then from there we had the, in the 3G we had convolutional codes also and turbo codes. So as you can see from 3G to 4G, there wasn't really much of you know, um, difference in terms of the channel codes that uh, these systems used. But all of a sudden in 5G, which is you know, being unveiled uh, these days, 
uh, we had like the entire paradigm shift uh, in channel coding. So uh, polar codes are replacing convolutional codes for control channel and LDPC codes are replacing turbo codes for uh, data channel and all these advance, uh, advancements are actually contributing to these you no know, orders of magnitude uh, increase in the data rates. And uh, so, yeah, what I was saying, you know, the, the standard body, which is called uh, 3GPP, uh, decided to inc incorporate polar and LPC codes into 5G. This is basically reforming the entire uh, channel coding cellular networks. And uh, well, one question is if 5G is already like an uh, like an uh, evolved human being, but 6G would be, so 6G would probably be something like an alien. We still don't know what that is, uh, but we have like uh, nine, nine Nine more, uh, nine more uh, years to figure that out. So, um, and uh, now speaking of uh, basically the uh, topic of this talk, which is machine learning aided uh, coding. So, you no, know, given all these uh, no advancements in the past decades, uh, seven decades, uh, there are still you know some problems, fundamental problems that we don't have universal solutions to. So. Um, uh, one is, you know, how to design optimal and efficient decoder. Okay, we, we know that map decoding is the optimal decoder, but it is in general exponentially complex. And we have low complexity decoders that are suboptimal. And uh, so what one thing we can, uh, you know, hope to do is to use the machine learning to uh, reduce the complexity of map-like decoder. So basically, you know, given a decoder that is, you know, exponentially complex, uh, how do we somehow prune its operations or the, uh, you know, the, the number of options that it's exploring throughout the decoding in order to uh, reduce the complexity? So that's, that's, uh, no, that's one thing. And uh, the other question, which is even more now fundamental, is uh, do we really need all these specific, uh, which are often linear, algebraic and combinatorial structures, you know, as in the state of the art codes? And uh, so, yeah, um, actually we're also going to explore this question in this talk. So we are going to use neural networks to find uh, good codes, but if we just use them blindly, the search space is going to be huge, uh, double exponential, and we, want, we have to somehow reduce it by imposing some structures uh, on, the, uh, on the types of codes that we want to uh, find using neural networks. So this is going to be uh, the other uh, problem that we are going to uh, look at. So let me start by some uh, preliminaries of the types of you know, uh, codes that we uh, uh, we kind of built upon uh, in this talk. So one is the polar code, the other one is with Muller. They're both based on the Plotkin construction. So polar code, uh, well, uh, if, uh, no, it's a linear code, right? So we can uh, we can specify the code using the generator matrix. The generator matrix of the code is a submatrix of these Kernecker powers of a base matrix two by two matrix one zero one one, and uh, so for example, uh, and the block length has to be a power of two. So n is the block length. Let's say to do it, uh, m uh, m is three here, and let's say k, which is the code dimension, is five. And uh, so we start with this two by two g, right? And then from there we have the four by four g to the Kernecker power two, and the other one is eight by eight. Um, and according to some process, we are going to you know, uh, select uh, five rows from this, uh, from this eight by eight matrix, make it a five by eight matrix that becomes the generator matrix of the, of the polar code. I'm going to explain uh, the, the criteria for picking these rows, these rows uh, in, a, in a moment. And so basically this, uh, you know, the encoding then can be represented by inserting zeros uh, here on the indices that are of the rows that are removed, and then the rest are going to be information bits. The reason that we do this type of encoding is because because of the recursive structure of this uh, Kernecker power matrix, we can um, you now easily multiply vectors by such a you know a square matrix. And um, so, you know, speaking of how to select these uh, uh, these uh, rows, we need to define the so-called bit channels. Uh, so this is, you know, this is the fundamental work by Arikan, uh, which is you know, like a breakthrough uh, invention to, to, uh, to uh, uh, realize the channel polarization and the construction of uh, polar codes. 
So the bit channels, uh, basically the indices go from uh, one up to N. So for each uh, index I, we have a bit channel with, with input UI and the output is, uh, is uh, you know, the channel observations, okay, by one up to Y and together with uh, all the other bits before UI, U one up to UI minus one. And here we just have this you know, linear transformation uh, that I described. And uh, so basically Arikan uh, proved that as n grows large, the bit channels polarize, uh, meaning that they approach either a noiseless channel or a pure noise channel. Also the fraction of uh, noiseless channels approach the capacity and that's how we can construct uh, capacity achieving polar codes by assigning information bits to the indices of noiseless ones and the rest of the, uh, the channels are going to fix to zero so that the decoder doesn't have to uh, decode them. Uh, and then uh, comes uh, read Muller codes. Uh, so there are multiple ways of describing read Muller codes. There is like an algebraic way. There is another way that I'm going to do this here. There is also a recursive way. And uh, it's interesting. So I'm going to cover uh, uh, you know, two of them. One is uh, the construction that by looking at the, again, canonical powers of G and also the recursive structure based on Plotkin. So if we look at this uh, G to the canonical power M, uh, it has an interesting structure. So it has exactly M choose I rows of Hamming weight two to the M minus I. And then the Reed Muller uh, code, uh, which we uh, represent by like MR. So R is the called the, uh, the order of the Reed Muller code. Uh, it's any parameter between zero and M has this dimension K, which is the, this sum some of uh, all M choose I's I from zero to R and has the uh, minimum distance two to the M minus R. So it maximizes the minimum distance given this structure of the code. Uh, so for example, read Muller three one, uh, the length is two to the three, which is eight and the order is one. So K is three choose zero plus three choose one, which is four. So if you look at this uh, canonical powers of G again, okay, so this is G to canonical power th uh, three, we can see that there is exactly one row of weight eight. There are uh, three rows of uh, weight four. There are three, uh, uh, three rows of weight two and one row of weight one. Okay, so like this first split point here. And we are going to select uh, the ones that have weight, uh, weight eight and weight four. And the, the other ones that have weight one and two, we are going to erase. So this gives me the uh, janitor matrix for three one uh, with Muller code. And uh, also there is a, there is the Plotkin concatenation in general that we can use to describe both polar and read Muller codes. So in general, uh, now the Plotkin method is a, is a concatenation method. Okay, so we take two codes, uh, let's say C and C prime, they are both of lengths N. And from there, we construct a code C double prime of lengths two N and it has, the code words in C double prime are given by U, U plus V, U being in C, V being in C prime. Okay, so that's basically the Plotkin, uh, Plotkin concatenation of two, two codes. Okay, uh, what's interesting about Reed Muller codes is that Reed Muller uh, is a Plotkin, is the Plotkin concatenation of Reed Muller. Uh, so MR is the concatenation of M minus one R and M minus one R minus one, uh, kind of reminding us of you know, Pascal's formula of uh, combinations. So uh, this uh, yields a recursive structure for Reed Muller code, right? So for example, for Reed Muller 4.2, it's a concatenation of 3.1 and 3.2. 3.1 itself is 2.0 and 2.1 and etc. Okay. So just uh, recall that order zero Reed Muller is nothing but a repetition code. And Reed Muller RR, like 2.2 is just a rate one code. Okay, so basically the leaves of, of this uh, tree uh, are either rate one codes or repetition codes or simple codes. Okay, and from such a you know, simple codes and this simple Plotkin concatenation, we have this you know, sophisticated Reed Muller codes constructed. Okay, so um, and the Plotkin also naturally comes with the successive cancellation uh, decoding. Uh, so in general, how does it work? So remember that uh, the Plotkin concatenation is having U and U plus V uh, as the you know, two sub vectors. 
And so first we compute, so LLRs are the log, like your ratios that soft, you know, uh, uh, soft information from the channel, basically telling us what is the reliability of uh, the bits. So these are vectors here, right? And um, uh, so using the uh, no, LSE operation, like some exponent, we can just you know, figure out the LLR of V. Okay, so given LLR of U and U plus V, you can figure out the LLR of V. And then we give it to, let's say the decoder of uh, the first component of the code. And then suppose it decodes it for us and gives us a V hat. And then using V hat and just the plus operation, right? Somehow canceling it out, we can think of it as canceling it out from U plus V. And then we can, you know, Think of it as having two copies of you. We just basically sum up the LLRs and we get the you know, uh, LLR for you. And the other component is going to decode that for us and give us you hat. Okay. So that's sort of the C decoding. And we can do that recursively, right? Uh, and we can also do the reverse operation to if you if you care about actually decoding the coded bits rather than just the information bits. Okay. Uh, so we can. Uh, now we can do this uh, recursive decoding for read Muller. So for example, you know, we can, uh, we can uh, use this tree structure and basically go down the tree and do the decoding at the leaves of the tree. But uh, you know, the, the one good news is that we don't actually have to go down to order zero. We can also stop at order one leaves because at order one, we know how to do map decoding efficiently uh, using the so-called uh, fast Hadamard transform operation. Okay. So the map decoding of first order Muller code is feasible and very efficient. And uh, also, you know, there is this, uh, I should mention that there's this great work by Dumer and Shawanov to do list decoding of uh, Muller codes using this structure. And basically list decoding is uh, sort of, you know, keeping uh, multiple options so not decode uh, just, you know, uniquely, but, you know, if there are multiple options, uh, we can keep them and basically explore uh, all of them when we decode the next leaf and so on. So, um, you know, sort of exploring multiple options and it gives us actually a you know, nice trade-off between the performance and the complexity and we can actually go all the way up to the map performance, but the complexity becomes then exponential. So that's the you know, Doomer's uh, list decoding. And the other thing is polar codes are also Plotkin constructions, okay? so. Uh, and uh, the, the binary tree representation is actually more regular. It's like, you know, just a full binary tree. And, um, and for example, you know, if we represent indices by you know, binary sequences, so we can you know, decode all the bits, all the indices that start with a zero first, and then all the bits that start with a one next. And then from, you know, within each, again, we, we do the same and somehow do it recursively by passing the soft information down the tree and passing back the hard decisions uh, to the top of the tree. And um, so what we need to do at the leaves, so the leaves are now just one single bit. It's either the information bit or frozen. Frozen meaning it's, no, it's just a zero. So the decoder knows its value if it's uh, frozen, otherwise it's an information index. So decision is made by the hard thresholding of the LLR. Um, so, and then there is this RPA decoding, uh, you know, very recently by uh, Abby and Ye. It's a, it's a you know, very interesting decoding for it, Muller codes. And so going back to the Plotkin structure, okay, it gives us a way of kind of projecting the Reed Muller to something smaller, right? And by projection, I mean, just looking at the code word, right? Pairing the indices, Okay, so in uh, uh, pairs of just size two, and then just XOR uh, any two coded bits in, the, in that pair. And that gives me, I call that a projection from read Muller MR into M minus one, R minus one. Okay, so Plotkin gives us one such projection, right? Just split the read Muller into the first half and the second half and pair the first bit of the you know, first block with the first bit of the second block and so on. But, uh, uh, you know, it turns out, and it's a very nice structure that there are actually n minus one, two to the n minus one, permutations of Reed Muller codes that keep their structure. Meaning that if you apply this permutation, you get the same, you get the same code book, okay? 
And uh, we can actually represent these permutations. These are the shifts by indices B, which are in F2 to the M. So if we represent the indices zero up to N minus one, using vectors of length m, binary vectors of length m, and think of them as uh, vectors okay, in, a, in, a, in a vector space. If we shift them by any of the non-zero vectors in this vector space, we get one of those permutations. Okay? And uh, now that's a very interesting property. So it means that we have n minus one such projections. And what, uh, what Abaye do is to decode across all these projections, Okay, so basically project the Rittmuller code into, uh, for example, Rittmuller M3. Okay, we project into uh, M minus one, two, and then from minus two, we project to M minus two and one. And M minus two, one, we can decode using map. And then we pass all these decisions back and do the aggregation. Okay, so, uh, so for any such uh, level of projection, we have N minus one decisions coming back and we have to somehow aggregate them to, uh, to decode the you know, code word on the uh, higher layer. So uh, the RPA you know, stands for recursive projection aggregation uh, for the Muller codes. Uh, all right, so the advantages of RPA is that it provides close to map performance, uh, at least for short block lens. So there's, there's no proof, uh, it's, it's all empirical. Uh, and uh, also it competes at even bits polar code with ST list decoding that are adopted for 5G in, in several scenarios. Okay, uh, that's the advantage, but the bad news is that the complexity is still grows uh, like with N to the R log N. So in general, this is not polynomial, right? So if R is constant, then yes, it's a still polynomial, but even that is not good for us. We usually want something that is linear in N or N log N, you no know, max, even N squared is not good for us. From complexity, you know, implementation perspective, we need linear or quasi-linear uh, complexities. Okay, so uh, and uh, another, you know, if you want to think about proposing the Muller codes for a standard, the other drawback is that they are not rate adaptive. So remember that they had very specific set of rates that we can uh, we could pick, but for polar code, you can basically change the dimension from zero to n to any dimension n you can have the construction. So uh, Rittmuller codes have that drawback compared to polar codes. Okay. So now let's talk about this uh, MLA that Rittmuller coding and decoding that uh, now we are working on. So there are two questions here that you want to answer. One is how to make the RPA efficient, reducing the complexity to be something n log n. And also how to pick the sub codes of Rittmuller code so that we can cover all dimensions from one up to n minus one. Okay, so these are the two questions you want to answer. Uh, so somehow, if you want to you know, address the rate adaptivity, we, we can pick codes that somehow you know, sit between the two consecutive order rate Muller codes between MR and MI, uh, MR minus one. So in other words, I pick those codes such, such that they contain the rate Muller MR minus one, but there are also subcodes of MR, okay. Uh, in other words, you know, the code dimension is between the dimension of the, you know, the lower order Rittmuller code and the dimension of the higher order Rittmuller code. If you want to pick the generator matrix, so we pick the, all the rows corresponding to the lower order Rittmuller code. And the remaining rows, I have to choose from the, you know, the rows, KU minus KL rows that are in the MR Rittmuller, but not what are not in Rittmuller M minus R, okay? So the question is how to choose those rows. If you just randomly select, well, it's not always good. And you know, we, we have done simulations. They are not all you know, the same. So we need strategies, okay? And also the set of good rows uh, depends on the decoding algorithm we want to do, okay? So uh, depending on the algorithm that decoding, we, we may have to you know, adjust those selections, okay? Uh, so first we, we have this sub RPA that we can apply to sub codes of Reed Muller that are somehow you know, sitting between the two considerable order Reed Muller codes. And basically it's just by the observation that if we do the projection to the subcode that is sitting between these two Reed Muller codes, then the projection also sits between the two consecutive Reed Muller codes, but you now with parameter n minus one, okay? And uh, so that basically, you know, uh, the observation that helps us to prove this. And uh, the other thing is, 
And that's one of the main challenges. If you want to apply machine learning based algorithms, we need differentiable functions. Okay, so all these hard decisions that we have been you know, looking at, for example, in RPA, we need to replace them with soft decision operations. Even the map decoding of first order Muller code, we need, to, we need to do it in a soft uh, you know, manner. So the main uh, features that we have for this soft sub RPA that we have developed is that we do soft map at the leaves and we also do soft aggregation, okay? So soft map, uh, well, uh, instead of making the hard decision, we obtain the LLRs of the information bits. And then from there, we need to obtain the LLRs of coded bits. Well, that's kind of complex. So what we do is we do the you know, well-known mean sum approximation to calculate the LLRs of the encoded bits from the LLRs of the information bits. And it's given by this you know, uh, formula. And uh, so we have that. So we can make the, you know, we, we have turned the map decoding to the soft version of it. And the other one is the soft, uh, uh, you know, sub RPA aggregation. So uh, for soft aggregation, we have, uh, you know, uh, we have these projections. We call that we have these projections. And uh, so let's say that we are looking at only Q of the projections. We are not looking at all the projections because at the end we are going to prune these projections and only work with a subset of them. Uh, so the question is when we, you know, when we do the projection, this is soft operation, okay? So we, we from the vector of LLRs L, we can obtain the LLRs of the projected code words. Uh, but the question is when we have obtained the soft versions, not the hard decisions, now the, uh, you know, the soft versions of these hard decisions, how do we aggregate them? And well, it's like uh, we, we have this you know, method that um, across all these uh, so-called um, cosets, and each coset has only you know, two, uh, two elements in it. So basically a coset uh, BQ is only represented by just one non-zero B in the vector space uh, F2DM, okay. And um, uh, so these uh, L hat I's are you know, are specified by these uh, cosets. And uh, well, based on some LLR combination formulas, we have come up with this, uh, you know, soft aggregation. One thing that I want to focus on is this, you know, averaging one over Q. That's what we are going to change with our uh, ML, uh, uh, with our ML method. So basically we are going to, instead of just taking a normal average, we are going to assume that these weights of the projections, so each projection has a weight basically. And we are going to learn those weights and pick the ones that are maximum, basically only pick those and keep those and uh, get rid of the others. And that's how we are going to reduce the decoding complexity. So that's sort of the whole idea. But how do we do this uh, you know, uh, more specifically? Uh, so yeah, we, we, we pick these uh, weights, right? And um, they, just, they just sum up to one. And we apply our proposed, uh, you know, differentiable soft, sub, uh, soft uh, sub RPA decoding algorithm. And then there is a, you know, there is a, a paper, recent paper called SOFT. Uh, the name is nice, okay, because it's actually do what it means to do. Uh, so it kind of, selects the top K, uh, you know, top K of these uh, numbers, but in a soft manner, right? So um, it's a differentiable way of uh, selecting the, um, uh, the top K numbers among the, you know, W, weights, WIs that we are uh, looking at. And then after we update these WIs, now we take the weighted average at the aggregation step and let the you know, ML model uh, to update these weights. And uh, at the end, we are going to pick the largest weights to get the best performance. Okay. So sort of this is the block diagram, right? So we have the batch of input that we use for training. We assume it goes through the channel. So we just assume AWGN. We get the batch of the noisy code words and we give it to this uh, training algorithm. So we start with the equal weights, WIs, okay? And in each iteration, uh, you know, based on the uh, binary cross entropy loss, uh, you know, our optimizer is going to update these weights WI. So the weight WIs are then updated and then again, another batch of noisy code words and we train. So uh, we, we you know, iterate this multiple times at the end, 
based on the complexity that we can tolerate, we are going to just pick uh, the maximum weights here and just keep the projections corresponding to them and get rid of the rest of them, okay? So here is the, for example, the performance we can get, okay? So uh, you can see that the, you know, the full projection, when we actually use all the projections, possible projections uh, that Abaye yeah, uh, do, and compare them with the way that we select, just you know, not uh, use all the projections, but those that the ML model tells us are actually on top of each other almost. But if we just had picked like random projections, you know, well, it performs okay, but with a gap, right? So this, this thing is actually doing something very uh, useful for us. And uh, the black one is, uh, is just a map, okay? So this is, uh, well, almost 0.2 dB uh, not, uh, away from the map, which is, uh, which is quite good. And also this is for a read Muller subcode. So, uh, you know, this, this parameter 14 doesn't quite match with, the, with an order of read Muller. It's the subcode that we have picked, okay? And, you know, just to emphasize these curves, are like as in any digital modulation, uh, digital communication curve, it's like, you know, black error rate versus the EB over and not the SNR. And uh, well, the, you know, the ongoing problem that uh, you know, we are still working on is how to pick these subcodes of Fried Muller code. I didn't really talk about that, okay. Uh, so one possible solution is try to jointly train the encoder and decoder together. Uh, but uh, you know, the challenge is that uh, the selection of the rows in the design of the encoder uh, now is a binary decision. So it's uh, again, something non-differentiable, which is again a challenge, okay. So anything that you want to do with machine learning, everything has to be in a soft way. I mean, anything like selection of rows is a, is a hard operation. So we somehow need to replace that uh, you know, with some soft binary and back uh, binary to soft transformation. So that's what we are you know, working on in order to um, also you know, optimize the way that we pick the subcodes of Fried Muller codes. Uh, all right, and uh, also emphasizing that that needs to be done jointly with the decoder. Okay, so that whatever selection that we do, we also have to you know be careful about what decoder we are using. So this thing, for example, what we are working on is uh, jointly training encoder decoder. So that the decoder that we get uh, using the method that, that I just described, together with this one, uh, is going to give us the uh, uh, the good uh, subcodes. Okay. All right, so now I go to the last part, which is talking about uh, KO codes, a new class of uh, codes. Uh, just recalling the pl Plotkin structure, okay? Uh, so the construction is based on the concatenation, U, U plus V operation, and the decoding was based on the two operations, LSE and the plus operation, okay? So what we are going to do is basically replacing that linear operation, simple U plus V, with some nonlinear G, okay? And this the G is actually going to be a coordinate wise, okay? So in other words, it's, a, it's the same G that you know, combines U1, V1, U2, V2, so on. So that's you know, at the end of the coding uh, implementation would be very easy and very efficient, okay? Uh, so although I represent G, G of U and V, it's actually coordinate wise, something very important to note. And, uh, uh, and we are going to you know, obtain this G uh, by training a neural network. Uh, at the decoder again, with the, instead of doing LSE plus, we need to do something else, okay? So suppose F1, two functions, F1, F2. And uh, so for example, you know, uh, by using, by applying F1 to these two vectors of LLR, we get the sort of the LLR of V and we decode V to obtain V hat. So the, the, the process is the same, only the operations are you know, replaced by these nonlinear operations, F1 and F2, okay? So if we have G, F1 and F2, and we need to uh, obtain them together, okay? Um, and we can also extend that recursively. So for example, we can have this G1 here and G2 and G3, and these MIs could be, for example, uh, information bits, or they can come from another code, okay? 
So if MIs are frozen to zeros or carry one information bit, that's like a counterpart of polar code. So KO codes, we can cons construct them to as counterpart of polar code or as counterpart of the Muller codes. If we pick, for example, MIs from certain minimum or maximum with Muller codes, for example, MIs could come from a you know, uh, order one with Muller code, then that way we can construct counterparts of the Muller codes. Okay? And so, for example, here I have, you know, I'm showing the counterpart of Rydmuller 3.1. We call it KO uh, 3.1. By the way, KO is uh, it's like knockout, but uh, it's actually, you know, Kronecker operation. So it's based on that you know, Kronecker operation of, uh, you know, that we have saw, uh, that we have seen, uh, that is used for constructing Rydmuller and Polar, but uh, we replaced, you know, certain subset of them be nonlinear neural network operations, okay? So, uh, yeah, so read Muller 3.1, you know, and using Plotkin concatenation, it's like, you know, this is a structure. And here, again, same as structure, the leaves are the same, but the, you know, the concatenation is now with G1 and G2. And also uh, for, uh, you know, decoding, so Dumer success cancellation decoding, basically, you know, uh, uh, use that LSCN plus operation recursively and decode the leaves, okay? So here we do the same, but at the leaves, we need to do soft map, again, for the same reason that I explained before, um, so that we obtain the soft information, right? And uh, then uh, we have to basically, you know, apply F1 and F2, but this is not the same. So for the next level, we, we need to obtain F3 and F4 uh, in order to obtain LLRs of the leaves. And then we do the decoding at the end by just uh, hard thresholding on the uh, on these LLRs that we obtain. Well, it's not exactly LLRs; something that you know, mimic the LLR for us. Okay. Um, and uh, one thing, one very important point is that we need to train encoder and decoder together. Okay, so this is like the entire block. So we have the messages M, uh, no, the encoding, KO encoding, and then channel. Which, which is typically AWGN. And then, you know, decoding, and we just look at the cross entropy loss between M and M hat, which kind of uh, mimics the uh, surrogate, the uh, bit error rate, okay? So the cross entropy loss is a surrogate for bit error rate uh, for us. And we, we train, you know, for encoder and decoder together. Well, not sequentially, so we do like, for example, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, 50 or 100 updates of encoding followed by you know, many updates of decoding, et cetera. Okay, so they're not exactly done sequentially, but like uh, several updates of encoder followed by several updates of decoder and so on. Okay? And uh, well, uh, for example, uh, this is comparing KO92 with, with Muller92. And the decoder is the same. Both of them are using su successive cancellation decoding here. And uh, uh, KO is improving, you know, uh, Reed Muller, uh, now quite, you know, well, uh, it's one dB, which is quite large in the context of you know, channel coding. And uh, it's interesting that it improves both the bit error rate and bit block error rate, although, you know, we uh, minimize the cross entropy loss, which is like the bit error rate. Okay, so we kind of minimize the bit error rate, but at the same time, the neural net somehow also. Uh, minimizes the block error rate for us as well. Okay? So that's nice. The other you know, very uh, surprising property of KO codes is that they're almost like Gaussian-like when we look at the pairwise distances between code words. Okay, so in general, when we look at linear codes, one important uh, characteristic of linear codes is their weight distribution, which tells us the distribution of the distances, pairwise distances between the code words. So for Reed Muller, it's pretty dis, you know, discrete. There are only four values that can take. Well, I think five values. And um, uh, but for you know, KO codes, because these are nonlinear codes and over real numbers, uh, they somehow follow the Gaussian distribution, which is very nice. I mean, we always want to. We know that Gaussian code books are the you know, best ones for AWGN, but we cannot construct them because well, we can, but we cannot decode them. Uh, but here, no, we have Gaussian-like uh, codes that uh, that we can also decode efficiently. Okay, so that's very interesting. 
And uh, we can also construct the counterpart of uh, polar codes. So here, you now we're looking at uh, polar code 64.7. For polar code, it's uh, kind of harder because we have so many levels. Uh, and it's also less a structure. So Red Muller is more structured. So we really have to you know, optimize all these GIs uh, for such a you know, low dimension polar code. So something you know, um, challenging to uh, you know, scale this into larger black lens and larger uh, dimensions, but nevertheless, we, we could beat polar codes as well using the KO version of them. Uh, so here we are comparing the performance of the KO with the performance of the uh, polar codes. Both of them use the success cancellation uh, decoding. Okay. And uh, the other thing is that we have the robustness. Okay. So in other words, we train on AWGN, but we test on fast fading, and I still you know, see the same improvement. So KO codes, the same KO that we train on AWGN, we test on fast fading and still improves upon with Muller codes. Okay, so that shows robustness. Uh, but in terms of complexity, uh, it's true that uh, you know, the computational complexity is order n log n for both KO and Muller, but this can be somehow misleading because there are constants invo involved here. Actually, these constants, uh, unfortunately, for, for KO codes are large, okay? Um, uh, so the actual number of operations is larger, but we are also working on the so-called ti tiny KO. So there are lots of work, this is not, you no. Know, uh, this is not very much related to the coding part of it. It's just about making the neural net more efficient, compress it, there are many techniques and uh, people are doing you know, lots of stuff on that domain in the ML community. So by doing you know, such techniques and compressing the neural net, we could reduce the complexity to you know, be somewhat in the, or the same order as, as with Muller codes, okay? It's still ongoing uh, you know, direction. So uh, uh, the you know, ongoing uh, work is that, well, uh, uh, we, we want to extend this to, of course, to larger black lens and uh, higher code uh, dimensions. Uh, that's for sure you know, a very relevant uh, you know, thing to do in order to you know, uh, eventually provide solutions for, uh, for wireless systems. Okay. And we also have to train for more advanced decoders like SC list, right? So uh, one thing about KO is that uh, we picked a certain decoder, which is the success cancellation decoder, and we trained the code based on that decoder, okay? But this is like a you know, general philosophy that we can apply to other types of decoders, advanced decoders. So we can, for example, start with the SC list and then train a, for a code that, uh, uh, you know, given that SC list decoder, okay? And uh, hopefully with that, we will be able to, for example, beat polar codes even with SC, uh, even with SC least decoding, okay? And uh, like I said, I mean, a scalable training for KO polar codes, the counterpart of polar codes uh, in KO uh, is also you know, going to, is also an ongoing uh, direction. Uh, well, uh, you know, more future directions. Um, in general, like I said, I mean, we, we kind of picked a, one a specific a structure, okay? And uh, we trained uh, you know, codes given that a structure. So basically we didn't, if we start you know, training blindly for codes, you know, this is not going to give us anything. It, it will be even worse than repetition, okay? So we need to somehow impose a structure and start from there. And uh, so we did that with the uh, plotting structure. So the recursive plotting structure. So this is this work, but there are other structures that have been used. So for example, the graph-based in LPC or the tailless based you know, for convolutional codes. Uh, one can also you know, do the same thing with these other structures. And which one is the best? Well, uh, no, this is something to still uh, answer. There are also various parameters that we have been handpicking. So for example, I didn't really talk about the SNR that we picked for training. Okay, so this is one important parameter that we have to uh, tune. So we don't wanna train for any, you know, for S different SNRs uh, separately, right? So we want to just train at one SNR and perform the code across all the SNRs. So, uh, this is like one of the handpicked parameters. There are other ones that we have to do. And uh, somehow we need to automate this process. You know, so far it has been only you know, handpicked. And in terms of uh, commercialization, well, we have to actually look at the hardware implementation of this. And, uh, uh, and then from there, perhaps we can you know, propose this 
uh, for our you know, uh, 6G uh, standard. And uh, so this is now, this is the really collaborative work with my PhD student, Ray Jamali at Michigan, and uh, my uh, collaborator, Sevon Vo at Washington and uh, uh, Pramod at Illinois and their uh, uh, PhD student, uh, Ji Yang and uh, Ashok. I would like to thank all of them. And uh, yeah, I stop here and take questions. Uh, thank you very much, Hassan. Um, any questions? Uh, hi. Uh, I have a quick question. Hi, Alan. Um, hi. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, really, really interesting stuff. Uh, I, I th this may be like outside your, uh, you know, your wheelhouse. But you talked at the end a little bit about the the computational complexity. And I guess yeah. one one thing that people keep bringing up about neural networks is the is the energy cost. Uh, mm -hmm. of running the neural network. And I wasn't sure if they're like, I mean, from talking to others or just to your own knowledge, do you, do you know if there's like an implementation, potentially like chipset implementation type uh, difference between KO versus, you know, these other, yeah, people so spending all this... the time making polar code chipsets, right? So Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the computational complexity kind of captures the, uh, power, right? So this is the number of operations that we have to do. Uh, well, um, reducing the hardware, you know, to, to reduce the size of the chip is one thing, and then reducing the number of operations is also another thing. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't really look into you know specifics of the you know powers that you know, this is going to. No, I just it's it's make. just because the complexity. Yeah. I mean, cer certain certainly multiplies and adds. You know, the number of operations is important. Yeah. But it's also like there are kind of be when, when you have like more structure mm. in the code, you can like take advantage of that by like you know in in yeah. hardware sometimes you can take yeah, advantage yeah. of it in a way that yeah, might yeah, be more yeah. challenging. Yeah, and, yeah, I guess yeah, the course. other and then the other question I had was um, for the different for the G's the different G's that you're yeah. you know, optimizing over. Do you have a like a, a similar architecture for them, or are you like choosing a kind of template uh is there much i mean is there a lot of juice to squeeze out of like you know playing around with the architecture of those networks or uh i think so yeah one thing i you know i actually uh, we are looking at is to uh, somehow just come up with one good g and apply it recursively yeah. and yeah, that's, that's what i was like like the yeah, bucket, yeah. Right? And then yeah and then maybe you can even you know prove polarization and uh you know, polarization with a non-linear color actually this is something we you know we, we have started looking at so it's still ongoing, you know, and uh, uh, you know that would be very interesting, actually, you know, to just you know, pick one G and replacing Arikan's kernel with a nonlinear kernel, and I think <laughs> that's going to be, you know, also very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, any other questions? So um, our students often think that um, coding is something which is not really used in practice. And you were mentioning all these various um, generations of wireless systems and all of them um, involved codes. Um, yes. So could you elaborate a little, or maybe we can see again that picture? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, this is, uh, I think, okay, let me actually, uh, uh, yeah, we probably need to emphasize more in our community to, uh, you know, this is one of the you know, very important impacts of our community in the wireless systems, right? Um, so, yeah, so this is, uh, you know, this is uh, one thing. So, um, in general, uh, that's all you know, what I always say is that whenever there is a, you know, transmission of data and the transmission can be either in time or space uh, uh, for example in a space it could be uh, you know the, the communication in time could be you you place the data somewhere like a storage device and you come back and read it later so whenever you do that there, there might be some errors and whenever there is an error in data you need codes okay, so that's the sort of the thing and uh, you know we will always have codes in any of the storage or communication systems and uh, and uh, looking at the evolution of the codes, you know, f starting from the you know, second generation, like convolutional codes, we, had, we always had error correcting codes. For me, the most fascinating thing, which I 
uh, uh, we, we just observed in the past couple of years is this you know, transition from turbo uh, convolutional codes, which are you know, more classical to polar LDPC. I mean, this is, and our, in our community, we have been doing a lot of these things, you know, polar coding and LDPC coding in the past 10 years for LDPC, maybe 20 plus years. And now, you know, it's very exciting to see all these, you know, into the practice, making, you know, this, uh, this huge impact uh, on the, you know, uh, evolution of the cellular networks. And uh, like I said, I mean, for, for 6G, you know, we are expecting something maybe, it could be these, you know, neural network-based codes or something else, I don't know. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very exciting. I mean, every 10 years, you know, we have the opportunity to propose new codes to the standard and uh, it will be always there uh, because you know, we, we always need higher and higher data rates and we, we always need to uh, provide uh, uh, communication to more and more users. Everything is just growing and growing and growing and we need to you know, keep up with the pace and for that we always need new inventions. Exactly. Uh, uh, when we push resources to the limit, then uh, we start making errors and that's when we need yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And coding and, is the best way to deal with uncertainty that we know. Yes, and there are like new mediums. I mean, speaking of uh, new uh, faces of coding in wireless, uh, well, no, we just tend to think of the AWGM, which is the classical one. But the reality is, for example, when you go to military trials, there are all these you know, sorts of other channels uh, uh, that we need to deal with. And you now, really, we, you know, for channel coding so far, we you know, mostly have been just thinking of the channel as like a black box, but I think we need to start you know, rethinking that and maybe, for example, look at like terahertz, which is very likely to be in the 6G and see if it can actually design codes uh, that can you know, work with the uh, you know, terahertz, for example, frequencies. They have you know, very different characteristics. The modulation is going to be very different and all that. So I think there are lots of things to you know. To, to explore, yeah, yeah. To explore yeah. yeah. And later today, you will meet one of our uh, faculty members, uh, Professor Bo Yuan, who is sure. actually interested in, um, uh, among other things, in making things uh, that are um, um, maybe f some kind of a faulty computation mm -hmm. um, more yes. reliable, uh, because also we are pushing limits of components of devices and we want to make reliable systems from unreliable yes. components. Yes, 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 yes exactly. Yes. Of course. And also for the students, it's actually um, the job market is pretty healthy in, uh, in wireless and in... Uh, yeah, especially. yeah, yeah, exactly. I heard that uh, companies like Qualcomm, they actually have a hard time to, you know, to, to find you know, system engineers because nowadays everyone wants to do machine yeah. learning. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Communications people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's been our experience. Yeah. So thank you very much, um, Hassan.